show's called Downstage Center with Sandy, and if you're an actor, well, it may come in handy. Let's dive deep into what you love to do. Hey, friends. Welcome back to Downstage Center with Sandy. Uh, my guest today is a director, an actor, a member of both SAG and AFTRA. She has worked on both coasts, New York City, Los Angeles, and here locally in Reno. She's an educator, and she is also the co-founder of Sierra School of the Performing Arts. Please welcome Janet Lazarus. Yay! Hi, Mama. I'm really impressed that you that you could say Sierra School of Performing Arts without tripping over it because it's had to go slow. It's a mouthful. Yeah, it is. It is. Can you tell us where you are? Because this is the coolest experience I've had so far. Tell our audience so, where you are, Mama. So my Wi-Fi just wasn't that stable in, in my place. So I asked a friend who owns a shoe store <laughs> if I could use her shoe store. I thought the shoes would be a nice backdrop. Right. right. It's like you're in a costume shop. Or a, you can put different shoes on for every story you tell. And she even sells jewelry. Oh, good. A little plug. What you got there? Oh, that's nice. Cool shit. I mean... Cool stuff. Yeah, you can, you can. You can say fuck if you want. And I probably will before we're done. And you know. <laughs> All right, Janet, where were you born? Oh my God, I was born in Queens, New York. Yes, you were. And I was so excited to ask you. Because many, I many have, years ago. I have love for New Yorkers like nobody's business. So I love that you're a New Yorker. Do you still have family there? Oh my God. No. Uncles. No? I mean, I have in law, I have in law, former in law family. Okay. But I don't. Weird. Huh. I, I still have high school friends that I'm still in touch with, but mm. actually, no, no family anymore. Oh. Wow. Um, when did you know you wanted to be an actor? Oh, you know that first breath you take out of the womb? <laughs> I don't know. I just know, <laughs> I, I just know that um, I, I was acting, you know, in life uh, when I was a little girl and I would, you know, try to get my mom to believe, believe stuff and she did and it was like, woohoo. Really, like lying? It was creative lying. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't lying to lie. It was, I wonder if I can make my mom believe I'm really, you know, sick right now or yeah. whatever it is. You know, I was just playing with it. Yeah, I, I see what you're it. saying. Well, that's interesting. And when I, when I wanted to get a good seat at the Mets game, yeah. okay, I would go over to the ushers of the, of the box seats yeah. and I would cry and tell them I lost my ticket worked every time really yeah i'm going to a mets game with you can you still do it <laughs> it's been a while <laughs> got it. I think you can do it did you do theater in high school oh yeah you yeah. did yeah were you the yeah. lead in everything yeah yeah i was mm -mm. um the first play that i did though was in middle school well actually i was in plays in elementary school yeah um that was fun but then when i got to middle school um i did a radio play hmm. and that was just great i got it was just all voice acting you know and it yeah. was really fun very nice um so you attended undergrad in suny binghampton is that right binghampton, binghampton. Okay, and where is that? In upstate New York, about four hours north of the city. Okay, okay. And that's where all people from Long Island went, to the SUNY schools. There are many, many of them in right. New York. And you know who else went to SUNY Binghamton? Who? Michael Peters. He did. did Believe it or not. Older than you, though, right? So you weren't there at the same time. We weren't there at the same time, but we discovered that we both went there. Was he a theater major? I don't know. Michael, if you're watching, we need to know this. 
Call in, Michael. Um, so I love this story. So you were a psychology major at first, and then you made the shift over. Now tell us how that happened and why that happened. Because the same thing was, I did the same well, I, You were going to be a psychology major? Registered as a psychology major. Yeah. And then wow. I, got, I got cast in a Moliere play, and I was like, I'm so good. I have to be a theater major. Well, you just, I don't have to answer then because you just answered for me. That's what so happened. What was your play? It was called <clears throat> Something Women. Something Women. Okay. I'll have to get back to you on that. It's okay. A while. But it was this bizarre three woman play. It was a three woman play. And uh, I was a freshman and freshmen weren't supposed to get cast in leads. It just right. didn't happen. Right. And so I, I auditioned and there I was as a lead in a, in a main stage play, three yeah. women play. And it was like, oh, well, goodbye psychology. That's right, that's right. Well, and bad, then you meet the bad people. Decisions. You fall in love with your friends that are theater majors and you meet your tribe, so. You can't stay just, with the psych people. You slot right in, you know? <laughs> you do. <laughs> I love that we have that in common. Um, wow. I know. Oh, okay. In college, you studied Grotowski, uh, Grotowski-based stage movement. So this is, I always like to talk about training. Um, Grotowski aims for complete integration of the actor's mental and physical senses to reveal the core substance of the character. That's the Google definition. Um, so can you tell us about Grotowski, what you learned, what you liked, what you didn't like? What is it? Well, the movement training that I got, uh, my teacher at SUNY Binghamton um, was trained by a man named Tom Orth, who I later met at UCLA, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, so it was based in Grotowski, but it was, it was a lot of things. It was Grotowski, the impulse work that we did, and I guess I should describe that a little bit, Yeah. Um, is learning how to feel an impulse and react. And that's a physical thing, right? So you have to be open to the impulse coming in. Yeah. And your body has to be free and ready and relaxed and in an energized state in order to respond. Right. And so we did all kinds of exercises that trained your body for that. It was a lot of physical stuff. We did something called the cat, which if anybody out there is familiar with the cat, you know what I'm talking about. It's a really rigorous um, kind of a routine a sequence of balances and holds and rolls and stretches and really dynamic animal like. And when I was younger, I just ate it up. I ate it up because yeah. I started out as a dancer. So mm -hmm. I wanted something physical. Mm -hmm. And that meant so much to me to be able to connect with acting through my body. Yeah. So you like the method, you like the, the movement that you learned. Do you use any of that now with your own students? Well, when I was at UNR, I taught a lot of the cat to you my did. movement students. I did, I mean, a modified cat because you really yeah. needed a big space with mats and they just didn't have that. Yeah. But, um, and I do, I incorporate, incorporate that in some physical warm ups that I do with students elements of it yeah um i still do partner stretches which were huge we used to do these partner stretches and we would use partner stretching as warm-ups before you know preparation for a show or a rehearsal mm -hmm. we would get with our scene partner and we would do like a a series of these awesome partner stretches requiring balance and strength and flexibility yeah. and i just ate that shit up yeah it's really important stuff. That's exciting. Um, what other techniques did you um, explore as an undergrad? Like, what else did you guys study? Gosh, that's a long time ago. Did you study Method or Stanislavski or Meisner? So, th 
this is really interesting. The difference between my undergraduate training and my graduate training was vast. Good. So my undergraduate training was Lessac. Remember Arthur Lessac? He was actually in residence at Binghamton. Oh. Does that ring a bell? No. Arthur Lessac. Uh-huh. So look him up. Hey. He was one Tell of the it. pioneers of L-E-S-S-A-C. Okay. Arthur Sack. Look it up, people. And he was... Listen up, people. I'm sorry. Um, really close. Expect him. <laughs> so Arthur Lesac, or Lesac, I guess we used to call him, um, was this short little man and had just boundless energy. And we did a lot of work with uh, what, what he called the inverted megaphones. We used to put... Open our mouths with two fingers apart, uh-huh. and everything had to be forward. Oh, right. And we used to do these calls. Okay, we used to go okay. hello, hello, hello. You know, up and down. You know, like on a range, like like hello. the Seinfeld episode. <laughs> hello. And there were these words that we used to call on. Hello, away, until, unearth, again. I can't believe I remember that. Hello, so you'd go, hello, away. You know, so you'd go through all the words. It was weird shit, let me tell you. That's great, though. You're opening everything up. I make my class do the hello. I just didn't ever think of it as an inverted megaphone. I'm going to steal that. Inverted That's megaphone. Good. I like that. And do we did exercise? that is so resonant in the bones of the face keeping everything forward yeah um i could go on and on about his method but it, but he was, your it was very teacher. interesting and so we did a lot of voice work yeah yes so we did a lot of voice work oh there's a customer hold on one second so serena's not here i'm so sorry that's okay um i was just wondering if there was any like white i'm looking for a plain white shoe i don't know i don't know okay Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can okay. you come back? She'll be here tomorrow. Okay, cool. Thank okay. you. Okay. I guess I should lock the door. Maybe Let me go lock the door. Okay. <laughs> oh. Hi, guys. Should I see? There's going to be a lot of editing in this one, huh? Maybe. We might just play it through. It depends on Mike's mood. <laughs> you know. So it's she okay. told me that there hasn't been a customer all day. And it now when to she's Adam gone. Whitney too in his interview. We just went to black for five minutes and all. Oh. Someone oh, knocked God. on his door. He was like, I don't I mean quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So anyway, okay. Where are we? So let's go on to um tell us about repertory theater in upstate New York. I love that. Um tell us how that experience helped shape who you are as an artist today. What did you do? What plays did you do? Okay, oh, taking me right back. Um, this is right after so there was this, college. So actually, this was during college, during okay. undergraduate. Um, the camp, the department owned, owned or had an arrangement with a playhouse not too far. And it was a beautiful playhouse. It's called the Cider Mill Playhouse. It was an old cider mill in upstate New York at Endicott. Wow. And we did plays there in the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent two or I think two summers doing that. And we just did plays back to back, back to back. And I'll never forget, um, I was in the House of Blue Leaves. I played Bunny Flingus. What a yes. great name. Bunny Flingus. Yes. Bunny Flingus. Oh, that's Don't you a great just part. the whole character from the name? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Funny. And it was the third show of a four show season. And so we, we were starting to rehearse the third show on Monday. Yeah. And we completed two play. We had run two plays. We were still in the middle of running the second play and it was Sunday and I started rehearsals on Monday and I had a lead part and I hadn't had a chance to know, learn my lines yet. And I learned the entire script. It's a three act play on Sunday. I'll never forget it. Wow. Could never do it now. That's amazing though. 
It's that, amazing what our minds can do. That we could actually, well, how old are you? are in your 20s, right? Or 19 or something like that. But 20, still, probably. Still. And what discipline? Because you know you're tired from already working on the other shows, right? So that's really great. Yeah. But there was a real work. There was a real professional ethic in this company. And yeah. I knew I, I had to be ready. Yeah. I thought you were going to say you got the chicken pox or something. <laughs> like the night before, I was like, oh. Um, after undergrad, um, you chose to move to Los Angeles. Uh, why leave New York? My teacher, my move teacher so I started to say that that there was a really heavy emphasis on classical training as an undergraduate voice and body right I didn't get any Stanislavski probably no method I'm trying to think if we did Uta Hagen as an undergraduate I honestly can't remember okay. Uta Hagen's my idol so um, when I graduated from college in New York my teacher my movement teacher said hey I'm directing a bunch of shows out in California. I want you to come out and be in one and choreograph one. And I went, okay. Right. Yeah. And, and I did. And I just stayed because my parents were getting divorced mm. and that was kind of a sad, depressing situation. And I didn't want to be in New York. Yeah. Just, I can so it's kind of my out. It's kind of my out. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's always the desire to leave home, right? Like we all have that in us to travel and explore and be movie yeah. stars. Um, and California is a sunny, bright, happy place. At least yeah. that's how it felt. And yeah. New York seemed depressing and dark and gray and expensive yeah. and scary. <clears throat> what do you like better now in hindsight? Do you like the East Coast or the West Coast better? That's a really tough one, Sandy. That's, yeah. I just love both. I really love both. Yeah. I think I feel more comfortable now on the West Coast. Okay. But for a long time, I really felt like a fish out of water. I felt like a New Yorker on the West Coast. Yeah, well, you were. You were yeah. cooler than the people around you, if you ask me. Definitely. <laughs> uh, what made you decide to apply to grad school? Um... I was hanging out in LA and it was pretty depressing. I was waiting tables and I just, I was getting small parts in um, what we called equity waiver shows, right? Yeah. And it was just depressing. I just felt like I was losing my joy. That's it. I was yeah. losing my joy. Okay. And I thought, this isn't fun anymore. Yeah. I, I loved acting. That was like, the thing and I was losing joy okay. so I thought I'm gonna go back to school and see if I can get it back and if I don't I'm just gonna move on to something else what schools I know you you got into UCLA which is incredible um, what schools did you apply to other than UCLA just UCLA and then you got I was, in I was in LA so girl I was in no I'm just kidding <laughs> that is so no. amazing. Okay, before before you say how amazing that was, I also tried to get into NYU as an undergraduate after two years at Binghamton, and I yeah. didn't make it. I think that's, they put me on the waiting list. That's silly. Well, that's a little competitive. Tell me about, so is UCLA, tell me about, I remember the audition for that, and they were like, we're going to move around, and they were like doing things like dancers at the audition for grad school, and I was like, I don't. I don't think I, I don't think I belong there. <laughs> <laughs> so like tell what? me about your um, experience auditioning for grad school. I was petrified. Yeah. I was petrified. Yeah. I, I think, what did you do? A classical and a contemporary? Is that what we did? I think I probably yeah. did Helena. Maybe I, Helena. Yeah, I did Helena too. I, yeah. I did Helena all the time. That's the I, best I, one, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then what was uh, your, do you remember your contemporary? 
it might have been it might have been Lou Anne Hampton Laverty Overlander, which is um, a show nobody knows, and it's really too bad. It's uh, part of a trilogy by Tr- Preston Jones, and I got to play the title role in that summer company that I talked oh, okay. about. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the best experiences of my life. That play, I had to age. Um, I started out as sixteen, and then I was middle aged, and then I was. Old, uh, no, not middle aged. I was 16, and then I was in my 30s, and then I was middle aged in the third act. Okay. And I loved it. It's mm. this Texas. I love character parts, and yeah. um, she yeah. was this woman from Texas. Nice. What's and it called it again? Luann mm. Hampton Laverty Oberlander by Preston Jones. It takes place in a small Texas town named Bradleyville. They might have good monologues in there if people are looking for that. Um, well, somebody should do it. Somebody should do that play. Play. You should do mm-hmm. it. Maybe. Are you interested in directing in the um, community theaters? I am. You are. Okay, everyone, another shout out. Another amazing director. The talent on Thank this you. one. So be smart about it. <laughs> you know, they could use you. It'd be great. You know, you're I also doing. love Pinter. I also love Pinter. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, what was the audition process? Were they kind? Were they? Did you have to do that movement thing I was talking about? I don't remember that. Oh, mm. it's yeah. possible, but I don't remember that. Yeah. I, I just remember they looked very serious. Yeah. And you did your thing. You did your monologues. Your two monologues. And it was thank you very much. And you had. No idea what they were thinking. No. It's the worst experience for anybody out there that wants to be an actor. <laughs> Auditioning is the worst. When you are young, you know, like now, yeah. when you're young, it's yeah. the worst experience. Because like you don't have the hard shell, right? You don't have the hard oh. shell. So oh. you have an MFA, which is a terminal degree from UCLA in acting, which is very, very impressive. Who were your, who were the professors that had the biggest effect on you? Who were your favorites? Delia Salvi was my acting teacher. So remember there was voice, there was movement. I was still doing all that, but now there was this method acting teacher. Oh yeah. And she was the kind of bitch, an acting teacher, a good acting teacher. She doesn't get, let you get away with anything. Yeah. Right. And I'll never forget the day that we were doing sense memory. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about it. You can talk about it. You can do it. You can do lip service. Mm-hmm. But when you really do it, it transforms you. And I had that experience one day in class. I remember my situation was that I was, I was drinking and I was in a car with friends and we were listening to the radio. That's all I remember about the scene. But I remember really doing the sense memory and I swear I got drunk. Really? I got drunk. Powerful. And there was no liquor, right? There's, you're just, I got drunk. Yeah. And the rest of the scene, I was, I was drunk in the scene. Really? I mean, it was, almost not acting. It was, it just, I was just being. It's incredible when it works, it, right? It's incredible. Yeah. So did you have her all three years or did you just have her for, she was your teacher I think the it, whole time? I think it was a two year program, by the way, now that I recall. And yes, you had your teachers for the full two years and you stayed with your I think it was eight, we were, there were eight grad students in the acting program and we were always together. I mean, if we were doing a play in the general program and there were 300 undergraduates at UCLA. Oh. oh. Including many people that have become famous now. Nice. Yeah. But we but, were the, under, the, the grads. Yeah. And we were always together in our classes. Nice. I see. Did you um, teach also like a TA? Did you have to do that? Yes. You did? In, in the movement, the movement stuff. Oh, you were probably there when I auditioned. 
Oh, okay. I want to talk about this. Okay. Well, this is really, really exciting. Um, so you co-wrote an original play called Just You and Me. And this play just plays between, it, Oh, Just Between. between? Ooh, I wrote that down wrong. Just, just, just Between You and Me. And Me. Okay. And everyone else and their Uncle Bob. Okay. And it played at the Eagle Theater in Los Angeles. So um, it won an LA Times Critic Choice Award. And you had a beautiful write-up in the Los Angeles Times. I um, mean, in that, you said, I felt like I was at the mercy of so many plays about men with women being appendages. And I just thought that was so, yes, right? Like it just rang all the bells for me. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about your play, how you came up with it, everything. Tell me. Okay. So I was in LA. I told you I did lots of the equity waiver theater and it just, it was sucking my soul, right? Yeah. And even after UCLA kept doing equity waiver and I win this play with, it's called um, Johnny Johnson at the Odyssey Theater, which is a very, very well-respected theater in Los Angeles. Okay. And I was one of, I think four women and there were probably 25 men in the play. So I'm setting the scene here. Spent a lot of time in the dressing room with the girls, right? Yeah. Because we had small parts. Yeah. And we were all so talented. All those girls, we were, we were talented, and we had these right. little things. So one girl, Jill Wachholz and I got to be friends, and we said we should just write a play for ourselves, and we did. And we um, we got together twice a week. We had a schedule for an entire year and we worked through improvisation. So it was, we would start a scene through improvisation. We'd come up with some character ideas and we would improv a scene and then we'd watch the scene and we go, that's a good idea, let's keep that. But then we would write the rest of the scene so we could shape it, mm -hmm. right? And it was a series of 10 character sketches on friendship, on the, on the, on the theme of friendship. So we okay. got to play all kinds of characters, which is what I loved. And that's why I was missing the joy. Yeah. And um, we, so we wrote it, we produced it, we got another director, we opened it and lo and behold, we were a huge hit. And we had celebrity, every, Eddie Murphy brought his office. And I mean, we were, we were a huge hit in the LA yeah. Times. And I'm all saying all this because there was like this, these months where everybody was like trying to get into its small theater and there was a waiting list and yeah. we were interviewed on K, K, um, uh, KCRW and we were in the LA Times. Yeah. And, and then as yeah. soon as it stopped, it stopped. Nothing. So disappointed because your expectations yeah. had been lifted. Uh, yeah, you start to think maybe this can really happen. Maybe mm -hmm. I can work as an actor in this town. Yeah. But. Right. Ooh, that made me. <laughs> well, that's sorry. hard. I can't imagine that. You know. It was a great ride. Yeah. It was. It was a great ride to wake up one day and see your face on the cover of the calendar section of the of the LA Times and this yeah. beautiful review oh, it really and was. people start calling you yeah. agents start calling you and I mean oh my god it was like oh my god this is really happening and then pfft. yeah and it was a comedy it's a it's comedy show yes two women show and it was about friendship it's about friendship and we played all ages and and uh just it was just great it was just great it was really fun and uh i'm, I'm so grateful that i had that experience in my life i'm yeah. so so grateful do you still write now plays do you have any interest in writing plays or creating plays oh now you're hitting on a really personal note because there's this thing that I feel like I should be writing. And for some reason, I don't sit down and do it. I think because I'm a collaborator. Yeah. And um, I need a partner. 
Yeah. And it just, it hasn't, you know, for 20 years I was a mom and a wife. And so I put most of my theater stuff, my writing and my acting was definitely put on the back burner while I, while I was directing and creating Sierra School of Forming Arts. <clears throat> but, and then when you come back to it later, your kids are grown and you come back and you start acting again. And it's, it's wonderful to recapture that. Yeah. Um, but now there's not that much time. There's not that much time. You're too busy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Can you relate? You're a, you're a mom. Yeah, but I just put him in the closet and I go on. <laughs> I guess where he is right now. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I'm, I have a lot of things I think I need to write as well that I haven't done, but I have all the time in the world. But then I'll just be like, oh, no, I've got to watch um, Ozarks with a bag of chips right now. And I'm going to watch all of it. Or I've got to, you know what I mean? Like, I'll find reasons not to do the work. Look at the guilt. I, I, do you feel, I feel guilty. I feel guilty that I'm letting myself down. Yeah. That, that I'm, I don't know what it is. Fair failure, lazy. I don't know. Well, I just do don't it. do it. Let's just promise each other we'll do it. Yeah. We can be accountable. Make a promise. Yeah. Okay. Let's make sure you're not glitchy first. Okay. Am I glitchy? No. Okay. I promise Janet that I'm gonna Janet, I'm gonna start writing by the weekend. I'll have written at least an outline of what I want to write. Okay, what I'm committed to what do you want to do? Check in once a week and just yeah. give each other par progress? Yeah. On Mondays. Okay. I'm I promise on Monday I will tell you what I'm committing to. <laughs> Wait a minute. I think I got duped. Okay. No, 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 no. Fair enough. I promise that I will check in on Monday okay. with a promise. Okay. I'm writing that down. Monday check in. Okay. I love it. I do too. Um, so while you're in LA, you have a very um, funny Carol Burnett story. Can you lighten our mood and share that with us? Oh my God, so many LA stories. Um, so I was working in a casting office because a friend of mine from SUNY Binghamton ended up being a major casting director, by the way. Wow. And she called me and said, Janet, we really need help in the office for a little while. Would you be interested? And I thought anything to get me closer to the business. Right. So I worked right. in a casting office. Rhonda Young, who used to cast all of Aaron Spelling's shows. I don't know if anybody knows that name, but he was very yes, big in LA. Beverly Hills. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so um, Rhonda, the, the casting agent who I was working for, that wasn't my friend. My friend was her assistant. But Rhonda Young was the casting director, very powerful casting director, and she was going to cast the next spinoff of family, uh, um, mama's family, right? Oh. There, yeah. there was another spinoff. I can't remember the name of it. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. And they were developing it and there was a part for a teenage girl. Well, I wasn't a teenage girl, right? but Rhonda really believed in me. She thought I was a good actor and she thought, Hey, you, you are very much like Carol Burnett, which I've yeah. heard all my all my life, people have been telling me. I could see that. Yeah. Very big, very comic. So yeah. Rhonda said, I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to bring you in to the producers. And Carol Burnett's there. Uh -huh. And I auditioned. Mind you, I was auditioning for a part that was about 10 years younger than I was. Yeah. It's okay. So I, it didn't work. But... <laughs> She was hoping they would fall in love with me and either write another role for me or rewrite the part or something. Yeah. Again, story of my life. Didn't you happen. So, you were so excited. Was Carol Burnett nice? She was very quiet. She, you know, wow. it wasn't a schmoozy thing. It was, yeah. you go in, you do your reading and you leave. Yeah. Um, you have another story about another um, female comedian icon. 
uh, Betty White. So um, it says that you worked with Betty White on a, a pilot for a new game show. Can you tell us that one? Oh yeah, um, I wish I could remember the game show. Um, it was Betty White was the host and there were like nine men, beautiful, studly guys. Yeah. And there was me, the contestant, and there was, you know, two contestants, me and somebody else. Right. And we were developing the show, so I was playing a contestant. Oh, I and see. She, she was a hoot. Yeah. She, she's quick. She's bright. She was probably only, like, in her 60s at the time. Well, yeah. Kind of, did the show ever happen? I don't. It did. It, it did. did? Um, yeah. Oh. I, I'll have to send you the name of the show. I can't remember what That's it was. That's okay. That's okay. This gives people stuff to Google. They're, now they're Googling Betty White game show. Um, okay, I want to pick one more. I want to talk about divorce court. You're on divorce court, right? So this is like Judge Judy or the People's Court. Is that what it's kind of like? Yeah, I can't remember the name of the judge at the time, but are it was all of those fake, or some of them are fake and some of them are not. They're actors. Judge Judy well, too. Divorce court. I don't know. Divorce court. That was actors. Okay. So who did you play? I played Mrs. Soren. Okay. I was Russian, and I was divorcing my husband, and he was not very nice. No. Oh. And uh, I lost, and uh, the judge must maybe awarded him something. I can't remember money. I don't know what it was. Anyway, I lost, and I got the real tears going Good. when when I found out. Yeah, there I was. This is one of my first gigs on TV, and yeah. I'm like, it's happening. I'm like really crying. I watched the show and like the camera was not on me. Oh my gosh. The camera wasn't on me at the end. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> I know. Lesson number one, I guess, but do they give you a script or they just give you an outline? Do you have to improvise all of that or? Oh yeah, it's a script. It is, okay. I think it's a script. Okay. I think you can, you can add to it. It's a little bit loose, but it's a yeah. script. Okay. Okay. Um, you worked at South Coast Rep, and you did a play called Search and Destroy. Now, that's a pretty famous theater, isn't it? Uh, it's a wonderful theater. Um, it's the only equity thing I've ever done. I actually didn't do the play. I did the reading. Okay. The reading for um, my friend Howard Quarter is a very, very talented playwright, and he wrote it, and that's how I got the gig. He asked me to do it. Okay. And uh, he, uh, his very first play was called Boy's Life, um, and people might know that play. I know that play. Back in the, that's Howard. Yeah, he was okay. a good friend of mine in Binghamton. Okay. And so he wrote Search and Destroy? I think he was commissioned by South Coast Rep to write that play. And uh, I think Mark Harrelick, do you remember, does that ring a bell? I think he played the title role in the reading and maybe even when they actually produced it eventually. But I left right after Search and Destroy. Oh. LA. Right That's, after the reading, I left. You want to talk about why you left LA? Well, I left LA because I was going to get married, but the reason why it wasn't difficult to leave LA uh, to come up, to move up to Tahoe, as a matter of fact, because my husband-to-be had a job up there. The reason why I was ready to leave LA was because I had just been through a very traumatic experience. Yeah. Um, I had been shot through the chest right there. That's insane. And yeah. what happened? You Where were can't you? can't see it here, but there's still... I was on the corner of Fairfax and... Um, oh, whatever the street is right below Cantor's Deli. There's like a newsstand and there's Cantor's Deli up the street. And so I think it's north of Beverly Boulevard. I'm, I'm losing the names now, but, okay. but 
I was parked in a little parking lot um, and I had just gotten back into my car and I had been at a meeting with a bunch of women. It was a fundraising meeting, much, much older women. And um, I was getting into my car and I noticed there was this guy standing there before I could get a chance to close my door. I was sitting in the passenger seat and before I could close my door, there's this guy standing there and he's, my peripheral vision noticed that he was holding a gun at his side. He wasn't pointing at it, he was just holding it down on his, at his side. And I think he asked me for my keys, although it's a little fuzzy, my memory of what he said was fuzzy, but I think he asked for my keys. And I remembered that just a few days before that, I had taken a mace class and I had put a canister of mace in between the bucket seats of my Volkswagen Cabriolet. Yeah. And it was there. But I forgot an important point from the training, which was you're supposed to stun and run. That's what the mace is for. Stun and run. Yeah. So I picked up my mace and luckily I got it at the right angle because you have to pick it up a certain way to spray it. Oh, yeah. I mean, this was, and I picked it up and I turned and I sprayed him in the face. And he said, fuck or shit or something, said something. Yeah. And then he picked the gun up, pointed it to my chest, put it right up to my chest and fired the gun. And he took off. And I thought, okay, well, my time's up. I guess that's it. Oh my God. But I was, I was, I wasn't dying. I was still thinking and had energy. So I got up and I ran over to one of the other ladies who's still in her car. And I rapped on the window and I said, I've been shot. And she like, ah, you know, so I said, can you take me to the hospital? And so I got into her car and the way she tells it is that I wasn't making any sense. I was giving her direct, she, she wasn't from LA, she was from the Valley. So I had to give her directions to where to go. And I used to volunteer on the crisis, uh, rape crisis line. I know I'm giving a lot of information. No, this um, is riveting. Cedar Sinai. So I was taking her to Cedar Sinai Hospital, which is where I used to do my rape crisis work. So. I'm giving her directions and in between saying, make a left here and at the left, I was saying, and, and tell my boyfriend, I love him. And then make a right there and tell my mom, I love her. And um, over there, you're going to make a left and just tell everybody I love them. You know? So like, she's like trying to hold it together. Right. Yeah. Cause I, thought I was dying. I thought any minute I was just going to go. Mm. Oh. And uh, she told me later that I wasn't making any sense. That yeah. it was, I was, I must have been in shock or something. So we come upon an ambulance, a parked ambulance, an ambulance parked on the road. Wow. Like, like, when is that, right? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, there's a lot of really interesting parts of this story, but long story short, ambulance got me to a helicopter pickup point. Helicopter took me to UCLA hospital and. And the rest is history. I so where miraculously, because my, my son is a doctor, and he, so so my, that's what my son just asked me. Said, "Mom, how are you still alive?" Because it went in here, and it came out here, so it went through at an angle. He said, "Mom, you the bullet couldn't have missed everything, but it did." Wow. I was, I was in the hospital for two days. Then I went home and, you know, there was just a wound that needed to heal. Maybe that's the story you And write. then I got pregnant several months later. Wow. <laughs> I tried. I tried to write a screenplay about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, it was that's called crazy. Point Blank. Okay. But never finished it. Maybe you're going to go back to it. That's crazy. Well, we'll know Monday. Yeah. <laughs> so how long have you lived in Reno now? Since 2003. Okay. 
So that's Reese, this you got shot in like 2002, 2003? No, so I got shot when I still lived in LA, but then I moved to Tahoe. Oh, and lived right, in Tahoe. Tahoe. I and, forgot about that part. <laughs> yeah. And um, I started having babies and all that stuff. Yes, a doctor child. So great. Your son is a doctor. <laughs> Love it. Um, what was your first theater experience in Nevada? Nevada. Nevada. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Do you remember? What was it? Oh, I was I was teaching. I met Stacy Spain. We were teaching at the Actors Conservatory. Oh which was be started by a teacher out of Sage Ridge at the time. Okay. So I met Stacy Spain. Um, that was the first real theater person that I met here yeah. in Reno. Yeah. Um, and I was teaching and directing. And then I did a Tahoe players play because yes. my son, my son was a singer and an actor, my younger son. And yeah. so we both auditioned together for, was it Snow White? I think it was Jungle Book. No, he was, he was in Jungle Book. And then okay. we were both in Snow White and I was the evil queen. Oh, cute. Was he good? He's, he was great. Yeah. He was Is great. that the one who is now a doctor? Well, he, the one that was the actor singer is in medical school now, but my okay. older son is, is a doctor, pediatrician. That's great. That's so good. Um, <laughs> what was it like working with the Nevada Shakespeare Company? You, um, I saw that you were in Macbeth and you played Lady, Lady Macduff. What was that experience like? So Stephanie Richardson was um, Mac, uh, Lady Macbeth and I got to know her and I worked with Joe Atack and a bunch of other people in that play and I hadn't acted in so long and it was really hard because I was still in mother mode mm. and yeah. I had two boys, two young boys at the time. And the time that I was away from them for these long rehearsals and remember Lady Macduff is really a small part. Yeah. Um, it was just a lot of time sitting around and I'm sorry when you're in your twenties and thirties, you love it. You love it. It doesn't matter. But yeah. I felt so torn. Mm -hmm. I felt so torn. So I didn't act again for a long time after that. Yeah. So it was really hard. Um, it was wonderful being around other, you know, actors again and in that yeah. environment and rehearsals. And, and I have to admit that it was hard to switch from being a director to an actor. Um, that very first time only because, and I'll say this because nobody knows this person, nobody watching this knows this person okay. because this person didn't live in, in Reno. He was okay. from London. Okay. But I did not respect him as a director. Okay. And I felt like he didn't respect my time as an actress. Mm. Yeah. And that was really hard. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It's hard when you have your babies at home and, you don't get to put them down for what? If you're not doing work, you'd rather be with your children. Lots of guilt there. Yeah. <laughs> I only do one thing a year. I try to do one thing a year. Um, and what you do, what you do is amazing, by the way. And I really admire what you do do. Uh, but there's not enough of you out there. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is kind of your educator. I wrote all this down. So you've been the director of theater at the Sage Ridge School. Um, you were a drama teacher at Bishop Nogue High School, a lecturer at UNR, and at the Lake Tahoe Community College. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It's very impressive. So you have touched a lot of our youth in the way, you know, in the arts that you have, you know, influenced them. Touched is the wrong word. Influenced them and helped help them um, find their artists. So that's a very cool thing. Um, I wanted to ask you, what techniques do you use? with your students. Any favorites that you have that you use in acting class? Um, I feel like what's what they really need at a young age is uh, uh, 
Uh, a lot of vocal and body work and encouraging their imagination because they're going to, they're going to get into all that other stuff as they mature. And, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this. The lessons you learn as an actor, as a young actor, don't really seep in until you start to really form yourself and you become an adult and things become richer and deeper and the connections are made. As a young actor, it's a, for me, it was a lot on instinct. I was going on instinct mm -hmm. and I had great instinct, but I didn't have a lot of life experience, right? The life yeah. experience really informs you so much as an actor, it's so important. So. I'm going to leave a lot of that mature, you know, stuff that's going to happen as they mature to them. Yeah. And I'm going to work on basics, with them, right? Articulation, yeah. using your body, making sure it's free and expressive right. and you're free to be big. You'll get smaller yeah. later, but yeah. get, get used to that expression, uh, that right. feeling of being free to express. So yeah. that's kind of what I emphasized as a teacher. Very nice. And playing, playing, yeah. you know, listening and playing and reacting. And right. um, that's the stuff that I think is a good foundation for young actors. Good. Maybe I'll send my son your way. He's 10. Send yeah. him over. Yeah, I don't think I will. <laughs> um, LaRonda is his acting teacher right now. So I don't know if she's willing to share. She's but, great. Um, having both of you would be great. Different experiences, right? Maybe. Yeah. Or maybe he'd like to audition for one of our youth plays. Yeah, he might. He's getting older. So, Miss Janet, you're the founder of, co-founder, I apologize, of the Sierra School of the Performing Arts here in Reno. Um, can you tell us about your company? Why did you start it? What, what do you do there? Um, way back in 2005, I had two small children who loved music and acting. And um, we auditioned for Tahoe Players, which was the only game in town at the time. You just totally froze. So should I stop? Oh my God, right? Okay. Keep going. It, All right. Okay. Okay. Should I start? Should I start that again? Yeah. Okay. So Let back me ask into you again. I'll ask you again. Mike, you better be awake for this one. Okay. Miss Janet, you are the founder of Sierra School of the Performing Arts here in Reno. Um, can you tell us why you began the school and what, what it is that you do there? Well, back in 2005, Tahoe Players was the only game in town for kids. And I mean, if they, they use kids and adults a ton of them and we auditioned for that and i thought oh my god this these people don't really know what they're doing they're yeah. they're putting on they're slapping people up on the stage and there's no direction yeah and i thought hmm i want a better experience for my son right and there were some other parents that you know we would talk and we'd go it's got to yeah. be better than this yeah so we got together and we founded um sierra school so our our goal was for it to be training and that's why we called it sierra school of performing arts because we wanted to have voice training and dance training and actor training and um that's what the vision was but that really didn't happen th that way we just ended up doing camps and a few classes and one big production every year and the idea was to um cast kids and adults, but the emphasis was on training kids. So yeah. the adults would do it to round out the program, but they were the mentors. Right. So um, a, lo a lot of kids came through our program, a lot of kids that are now out there and really doing it. It's Aww. really exciting. Um, but so we did something called Broadway Bits, which was yeah. I took four or five well-known Broadway shows and I condensed them down to about 20, 25 minutes each. Yeah. And so the people in the show, in Broadway bits, got to play 
play a part in every single show, whether they were chorus in one play, but the lead in the other. So it was great training, yeah. great training. Um, and a lot of songs and a lot of choreography and a lot of characters. So they really got, and the beauty of it is they got introduced to some of the greatest Broadway musicals at a young age. Yeah. <laughs> so they get that education too. Okay. Um, what is your biggest joy working with you? Um, I really like working with smart, creative kids. So um, that's what you get in the theater. You get smart, creative kids. And yeah. I like being around smart, creative kids. Yeah, me too. Uh, what's the biggest challenge working with you? Uh, them showing up because mm. they're not in control. Yeah. Um, their articulation isn't there yeah. yet. Their voices yeah. aren't there yet. Yeah. You know? Um, and what one of the biggest challenges, you, you, you love them, and then they grow up, and they're gone. Yeah. And that's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, your babies. Yeah. yeah. I could feel that. Um, but we have, we have kids that started with us as kids, and now they're adults, and now they're they're in our shows as adults. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, can we talk about the Lear Theater? And um, can you tell the audience, so the Lear Theater is a pretty famous theater that is empty, sitting empty downtown, right? And uh, how long has it been there, empty? Oh my God. Well, you know, it started out as a church and then uh, the church sold it to a theater coalition that wanted to make it into a theater. And that was years ago. I'm, I'm thinking that was over 10 years ago and I'm sorry, I don't have my dates. That's okay. Um, but quite a while ago and they raised a whole bunch of money and um, it just was poorly managed. And there was a lot of improvements that were actually made in the theater. It's a beautiful theater inside. There's some beautiful yeah. things. And they really did a lot. They did a lot with the money, but they didn't do it. They didn't manage it well. So it's been, it's been just boarded up and nothing for a long time, for like at least five years. Well, and it feels like longer. Uh, maybe longer. No. Maybe more like eight years. Okay. Eight years. I mean, so ever since it closed again. So it, it was open for a while. Yeah. There were some things going on there, and then they closed it again, and then the fence went up, and that's been about five or eight years since. And so last year, who had the was it the city that had the idea to auction it, auction off use of the space to a company, a not for profit company, for a dollar? Is that is that so, the? So the city gave it to our town. The city of Reno gave it to our town and then our town didn't do anything with it. They were doing studies and they had plans, but nothing happened. And then they decided they were gonna put a, a request for proposal out to nonprofit arts organizations to buy it, to actually buy it for a dollar with the caveat that you had to do the renovation and create a theater so it had to be a theater it couldn't be a parking lot or a store or any a right. hotel anything it had to be a theater and that that i mean there were some incredible proposals from di di various groups in the community they were all great ideas somehow they they chose us um and we had a development team so we had we had an architect and I wasn't in charge of this. I was just kind of a consultant to the okay. direction that the theater would go. But yeah. we had a, de a development team that was in charge of raising the money and actually making the construction happen and all that stuff. And we, we were really excited about it. It was going to be a building that any arts organization in this community could use. It was going to be a center. Certainly, we were going to use it, but it was right open right to 
theaters and ballet studios and mm -hmm. anybody, um, musicians, everything, jazz. I mean, we had all these great ideas. Right. And we negotiated with our town for almost a year, going back and forth with the negotiations of the agreement. They didn't and, like your plans or? Well, we had some problems with their restrictions and they had some problems with ours. And so we had to keep, you know, negotiating and going yeah. back and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. We went through like three iterations of a rewritten agreement. And finally, yeah. we thought we had a deal. We had everything in place. We had a tax credit consultant. We were going to do this with tax credits and right. we really had a plan. Yeah. <clears throat> we get a call like just a few days after we really thought we had it. And our town just said, we're going to stop negotiating. We can't make a deal. And we don't know why. We just don't know why. We don't know what happened. So it's just dead in the water and there's no, there's no reason that you, you have not been given a reason. We were never given a reason. Mm -mm. Isn't that nope. strange? It was very strange and very disappointing. Well, that's and another devastating. one of those things, right? Where you're like, oh, we have a space. And oh. And we no, we don't. Yeah. Mm, sorry. Well, it's for the children. Like, I think, you know, that's a real shame. Yeah. It is. It's a real shame. Think of the ballet studios and the musicians and the, the concerts and, and the, the yeah. theater and the classes. Okay, don't get me started. Yeah. Is it really over? Is, could it come back or? I think our town is making an announcement um, like soon, like this week about some sort of development deal that they've made. So I hope it happens. I, I, I wish everyone well, you know, it's disappointing and sad, but there must have been a reason. And I wish everyone well, I just want to see that theater happen. Yeah. It, it needs to. Well, fingers crossed. Look at all the things we have to look forward to next week. Art town announcements, writing plans. This is good. Um, oh, let's talk about the humans. So last fall you were at, um, you were in RLT's The Humans and you played the mom. I loved you as the mom. I just oh, really loved you. you. Yes. Thank I you. loved when they were talking smack about you and you were like, I'm not having that. <laughs> I loved all those little moments. I loved your relationship with your husband. He has really, if you could feel the the separation there. You know what I mean? You could feel all the ick. Um, talk about that. Talk about Chad as a director, working with Rosemary, um, all of that. Um, it was very, very wonderful and special. Like I, like I said, I, I don't act very much anymore. Yeah. And it's always scary to me. I was, I remember Chad offered me the role and I went, I don't know if I can memorize all those lines. I have an old brain. And remember I told you how I used to really memorize well? Yes. Yeah, it changes. Well, it changes. And yeah. so I was petrified, absolutely petrified. So it was a huge leap for me to say, yes, I can do this. I'll do yeah. this. Um, it was wonderful working with Chad. It was wonderful working at RLT. It was one, my castmates, I just, I just want to hug them. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy Welch, um, oh, yeah. I mean, everybody was so giving and we were such a team. We were such a family, you yeah. know, and, and it felt so wonderful to be acting again and making that connection to people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very special. And, and I what a it. great script. Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's just such a heartbreaking yeah. story and so mysterious, you know? I think I got it now that it's in his it's in the deterioration of his own mind, right? Maybe. Oh no. <laughs> um, because oh. the playwright 
started out writing a horror play. And so mm -hmm. he was combining family drama with horror play. Oh. So it was kind of this weird kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When you graft two things and you come up with a... Oh. <laughs> I know what you're saying, but I don't know. It's right on the tip of the brain. Put it in the comments, people. <laughs> yeah. Put in the comments. Right there. What is that? Hybrid. Hybrid? What is it? Hybrid? Yeah. Yeah, that's one way. Yeah. Ah, that'll do. Yeah. Um, is there a role that you've always wanted to play? What is it? Lady Bracknell. Ooh, that's juicy. You would be good. You would be real good. I love comedy. I love comedy. Oh. Yeah, that's a good one for you. I would oh. love it very much. Oh, you'd be so good. Oh, yes. Any others? Or mm. I'll throw those out there. One of the fa my favorite, favorite roles I've ever done was the one Emma in Betrayal. Um, I, I wouldn't play it again, but I would really love to direct it. Um, okay. I love, love that play, Betrayal. Oh, mm, can't, nothing else comes to mind. You know, I, I'm a, a frustrated musical comedy star mm. who can't really sing. I mean, I have an okay voice, but I've never trained it. And so I live vicariously when I direct shows through, I have the utmost respect <clears throat> for musical theater performers. I have the utmost respect for yeah. their singing ability because I can't do it. They're all right. They don't... Yeah. Yeah. Triple threats. Jerks. Right. Man. <laughs> I'm jealous. Yeah. I I have some bitterness in there. I have some bitterness. A, a um, little, a little bitter, bitterness in there. I do. Who's your hero, I, Janet? Uh, who's my hero? Yeah. Oh God. Um. Oh, that's so hard because I just, I respect anybody that gets up every day and makes things happen mm -hmm. and contributes to the world yeah. and is not selfish. And we're all selfish, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. We all have selfishness, that's yeah. human. But I admire selfless people, whether they are in, in government, whether they are in the medical profession, whether they are journalists, where, whether they are just parents, Mm -hmm. um, anybody that devotes their time and their energy to contributing without it being an ego thing. Very nice. I like that answer. Well, I have a question we might have already answered. It's our final question. I wrote, what's <laughs> next for you? I think we kind of know, but what what is next for you? Well, you know, we, could, we couldn't do Annie this, this summer. Yeah. Um, so I managed to cast it. Uh, it took two months. Yeah. With COVID and everything. Um, yeah. So, so that's next summer. So I, I'm starting to actually work on it. Um, okay. But I want to put together a variety show for Art Town Aww. and pull in all these amazing musical theater talents that I've gotten to know through, yeah. you know, those that we do um, and put that out there for the com for the community um, so they can get a little taste of all the talent that we have in a really easy Fun. way um, and an online musical developing an online musical wow. I'm, I'm actually I lied when I said I'm not writing at all because mm -hmm. I, I have been sort of working on a musical uh, with a partner, but it's just taking, it's like okay. been five years. But it counts. Five years. It counts. Still counts. It counts. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm going to be moving into a new house in another year. So uh, believe it or not, I'm a real nerd, and I'm working on my floor plan, taking measurements and creating oh, floor plans. I love it. And trying to design my space for the rest of my life that I'm going to live in. I love that. Huh. I like that a lot. I want to do that. I want that to be my day tomorrow. Maybe I'll just get like a Barbie townhouse. Ooh. Oh. That sounds I like had fun. one as a child. Oh, okay. did I love Barbies? I did oh. too, and I feel ashamed of that now. You know, because they were Why? all because they didn't support our they don't support women. They teach us that a woman who couldn't stand up with the is the ideal. You know, it's all about the car you have. Nobody wanted homeless Barbie, you know? <laughs> it's just all materialism. And do you think that that harmed us? Do you, do you a, think that we are not strong, powerful women because we played Barbies? I don't know. I think I might have an eating disorder because of it. Oh, uh, we all have eating disorders. Yeah, exactly. Because we all play Barbies, Janet. <laughs> oh, that's the connection. I forgot. That's the next show. But there's the psychology. and an eating disorder. My name is <laughs> Barbie. See, it all comes back to our psychology thing. See, we still got it. We love psychology. We do. Okay. In the fashion of my alma mater, the Actors Studio, Janet Lazarus, are you ready for the great questionnaire used by Bernard Pivot? Oh, I should have prepared this. Okay. Oh, it's better when you don't. Okay. okay. I'm ready. What is your favorite word? Yes. What is your least favorite word? Shut up. What turns you on? A beautiful voice, whether it's singing or speaking, and great intelligence and articulation. Somebody can put their thoughts in in uh, beautifully articulated words, I'm yours. Okay. Men, work on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what turns you off? Crassness. Um, rudeness. Disrespect. Yeah. People shouting. Just the ugly side of humanity, that's all. Um, what sound or noise do you love? Oh, the sound of my younger son's singing voice. What sound or noise do you hate? The sound of somebody screaming in anger. What is your favorite curse word? <laughs> That's the best one yet. <laughs> um, um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, psychologist, probably. Or, or preacher, or rabbi, or priest, oh. or something okay what profession would you absolutely not like to attempt i couldn't be a nurse or anything like that where you have to see a uh, physical pain yeah or cause it yeah a shot or an iv or i yeah no can't do All it right, i'm a if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Don't worry. It, it, it all went exactly the way it was supposed to. Oh, that's a good one. 
thank you, Janet, for coming on the show. And it was so nice to get to know you a little more and talk to you. Thank you. So yeah. honored that you asked me and it's been a pleasure. And I look forward to our Monday check-ins. I know that will be good. And we're going to do it, people. We're going to do it. And we'll keep you posted somehow when you see our wonderful shows, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for watching, everyone. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Be safe. You too. The show's called Downstage Center with Sandy, and if you're an actor, well, it may come in handy. Let's dive deep into what you love to do. There's interviews with thespians. They're fun to watch, so let's be friends and listen to the actor's point of view. Because this is Sandy's show. This is Sandy's acting show. This is Sandy's interview show. This is Sandy's acting interview show.